Contrary to popular belief, the typical criminal abortionist was not a greasy old man with a coat hanger lurking in an alley, nor was it the woman reaching for the rustiest coat hanger in the closet. Typically, it was a doctor or somebody else with medical training. This is Christina with the Sisyphean Journal, and today is January 28th. Welcome to the Sisyphean Journal, where we talk about abortion deaths and how they can be prevented. Now, on another video today, I talked about a self-induced abortion death in Pittsburgh with a woman using slippery elm bark, which I haven't seen that in Chicago, but I've seen it in more than one case in Pittsburgh. Chicago seemed to be pretty much the land of doctors and midwives, and the three Chicago deaths whose anniversaries are today are just three examples. So on January 28th of 1911, an 18-year-old homemaker named Lily died of septicemia that um, had started with an abortion performed less than a week earlier. A Dr. Aldrich and a Mrs. Treshling were held by the coroner, but I haven't been able to see any evidence that the case actually went to trial. So please like, share, subscribe, comment, get me monetized so I can go to Chicago and find out exactly what happened. Moving forward to January 28th of 1912, a 28-year-old homemaker named Mary died at the practice of midwife Anna Klickner from an abortion performed the previous day. Klickner was arrested on the scene but escaped. She was captured on November 26th and indicted on December 15th, but like, share, subscribe. I don't know why the case never went to trial, and I want to find out. The last death we're looking at today was a young woman named Laverne, 22 years old, who died in her Chicago home on January 28th of 1943. Dr. Henry Gross was found guilty of manslaughter by abortion in her case. Now, the prosecution presented Gross as having a dual personality. He had a respectable medical practice. However, after a Dr. Ira Willis died, Gross set up shop in Willis's old office under Willis's name, and that's where he ran his abortion business. So Laverne's mother-in-law testified that Laverne's fatal abortion was perpetrated there. Laverne had paid an office attendant $60 for the abortion. And the day after Laverne died, Mrs. Perez said Dr. Gross appeared at her home with a gun, which he used to threaten both her and her son. They wrestled the gun away from him, and then he begged for the weapon back so he could use it to kill himself. He had insisted that he had only been treating her for a cold. However, he was also investigated for the February 1943 abortion death of another young woman. I would love to know what exactly was going on with all these doctors and midwives in Chicago.